I was testing my mic, but I thought I'd just go ahead and introduce myself. So, do you want to say anything else? No, I'll, I'll, I'll do it at the end. Okay. Also, my name is Francie Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of the American Indian Resource Center. And I'm here to talk today about myths and, and realities about substance abuse in American Indian communities. And I have as my colleague here, Davina Spotted Elk, who is going to give some history and some background also. So we're going to kind of split this in half, and then we'll leave some time for some questions. My uh, mic's not picking up on my shirt, so I'm going to look silly here holding this little tiny microphone. So this is an extremely, extremely difficult subject for me to talk about. I have family members that have substance abuse issues, and yet as a professor here on this campus and the director of the American Indian Resource Center, one of the things that I find is relatively consistent is when the subject comes up in the class, one of the classes I teach is American Indian Experience. And we go through a lot of different um, processes and look at videos and everything, but one of the constants that come up, there's a whole series of stereotypes that are repeated every single semester I teach. And some of them are, and I'm just going to run through here, and these are all incorrect. All American Indians live on reservations. So when I talk to students and everything, it's always about those Indians on the reservations. 75 or more percent of all American Indians are urban. In fact, the largest American Indian population in the United States is New York City, which has close to 150,000 American Indians. Second is LA, which has over 100,000. And of those, about 6,000 are Navajo. So this is the actual reality. Um, Reservations are lands that were given to Indians by the U.S. government. Reservations are tiny pieces of land that were always ours that the U.S. government neglected to take from us. American Indians get free education. <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> you should see my Sally Mae. This is absolutely untrue. In fact, under federal law, no person can get educational funding based solely on their ethnicity. Now, the University of Utah has American Indian scholarships, but that is because they come from private funding. They are not federal <coughs> funds. Um, American Indians get government, U.S., monthly checks. Somebody's picking up my check. But we hear this a lot. They think that we all get checks, that we don't want to work, that we're all alcoholics. We hear this all the time. And in my classes, it gets pretty blatant sometimes. We have to pay federal taxes the same as anything else, or anyone else. We don't pay state taxes if we live on the reservation. But we can pay tribal taxes. But we all pay federal taxes. This becomes an issue because when those taxes are allocated back, they allocate back to states with incorporated cities, which none of the reservations qualify for. So we never get a cent back of the federal taxes we pay in compared to somebody that lives and works in Salt Lake City. This also affects the health care that we get. Um, we have 80% unemployment on my home reservation. This is a fact. But most of the reservation has no cell service, so we can't set up some sort of an internet business. We don't have access to railroad service. We don't have an airport within 160 miles. We don't have rail service that is adequate to transport manufacturing if we had it. So the reality is unemployment is based on isolation. If you take a large reservation like the Navajo Reservation, many of these same situations arise there, plus the fact 
keep in mind that a reservation like the Navajo reservation is larger than the state of, of West Virginia. And on that reservation, there are only a few paved roads and 22 grocery stores, which are all situated around the different villages and towns of some size. If you live in this environment, the isolation alone can cause difficulties. Free health care. For me to get my health care services, I would have to try travel to Northern Ute Reservation and then hope that they will transfer my funds and bill my reservation because my IHS hospital is in Oklahoma. So if I want just maintenance care, I would have to go to Oklahoma to get the annual checkups, et cetera. This is a very many American Indians live more than a thousand miles from their IHS servicer. Mythical lifestyle. When I lived and taught in the Netherlands, we talked about one of the key sacred elements of American Indian traditional society was to maintain a sense of humor. And I had people come back and say, well, you may not have enough to eat, but at least you're all happy. So anyway, facts. There is continued racism that affects American Indian <coughs> populations. Recently, there was a situation in South Dakota where a non-reservation school in Sturgis, Wyoming for a fun homecoming uh, party took an old car and painted racist slogans on it about prairie, the N-words, go back to the res, and then had people buy $5 tickets so they could smash it. There are American Indian students that live and work in or go to school in those schools. So imagine how much that affects your mental health. And alcoholism, substance abuse is about mental health issues. Historically, there's some errors that you have to look at. Colonization, which first came in. During the period of colonization, I know you've heard a lot of comments about terms like redskins and that football team. That term originated with the bounty placed on American Indian men, women, and children. It was called rouged flesh or red skin, which meant scalps. And the Dutch and the English and the French all offered bounties on human scalps so they could say the land was empty. Because under papal law, under Tela Nullis, if there wasn't somebody using the land productively, it could be taken and claimed. So these things build a historic trauma, along with expansion, Trail of Tears. I'm in rural Choctaw. My people were removed by force from their homes and pushed across the Mississippi River, where over a quarter of the people that were forced to walk there died and placed in someone else's territory, other Indians' territory. Treaties and wars. The United States made numerous treaties, and in those treaties, they promised the things we're talking about, housing, food, education, Every single treaty the U.S. engaged in was broken by the U.S. So many of those things that we are promised, we've never received to this day, although we did lose the land. Dawes, off-reservation, probably one of the most disastrous thing that builds towards this historic trauma is the off-reservation boarding school. And I feel a little guilty even talking about it because Davina has produced an extremely excellent uh, documentary on that. My grandparents, my grandmother went to a boarding school. In that school, she was punished for speaking her language or expressing any of her cultural background. One of the things that the boarding schools did was eliminate the ability for men and women to be good parents. 
it absolutely beat out the mothering fathering instinct which suffers our, our communities suffer from this abandonment issues to this day number one problem for American Indians to this day is Hollywood 99% of the stereotypes that I'm talking about were created by Hollywood within the last week I had somebody say to me when they wanted to get together and have a meeting we should just have a little circle up the wagons and I said technically I'd really prefer that you don't use that term because that is a Hollywood representation of white people entering my homeland that was guaranteed to me by treaty and murdering those that were trying to protect the women and children of that area. Plus the fact, coming from a farm background, you don't have any idea how hard it is to get an oxen to circle up. <laughs> and despite what Hollywood would tell you, those great big wagon wheels are not force fields. We can shoot through them if we're riding around. And once you've got those wagons circled up, you've got enough water there to feed your oxen and your people for about 24, 36 hours. We're going to pull out the lawn chairs and kick back because you're not going anywhere. There is absolutely no reason we would ride down there and ride round and round until you pick us off one by one. So this is part of the Hollywood myth. The subservient American Indian woman and I won't use the term, <laughs> is totally Hollywood. Our, predominantly, our societies were matriarchal and matrilineal. When I list my name when I start speaking, I'm telling who my grandmother was and what duties I was assigned as a woman. And in most of our cultures, we still turn to the grandmothers and aunties for all of our knowledge. Hollywood created the better red than dead, or dead than red. If you ever see the old movie of Stagecoach, there's the concept in it where the woman thinks she's going to be, the nice white wife, thinks she's going to be captured by the Indian, and the husband reaches over with a gun to kill her because it would be better to be dead than have her touched by an Indian. These tropes continue to affect kids today. We hear this. If you go to a movie like Pocahontas and you have native children there, that affects them. I remember attending a movie when I was probably seven and the feeling I felt coming out of it when I realized those people that the 7th Cavalry were killing were my relatives. Obviously, they were white people dressed up in black wigs, but the concept was this is what my people were worth. That people would cheer when one of my people were killed in a movie. So these things, termination, the United States government in the 50s, and keep in mind, we weren't even allowed to be citizens until 1924, and when we were made citizens, it was based on the fact it was cheaper to make widows from World War I citizens than to pay them alien widow benefits. So we were all forced to become citizens of the U.S. in 1924. In the 50s, the U.S. government just terminated a bunch of tribal nations. Just said, you, you don't exist anymore. Then uh, relocation, and this is why so many people live in big cities. American Indians, to get an education, then had to re relocate to major cities. So we have a long history that provides us with lots of reasons for students to have self-doubts, have low self-worth, and end up in problems. American Indian students are more likely than any other student to be disciplined in the school system and expelled. In fact, the University of Utah has done a very good study on this. So there are problems, and, and it, I would be the last to, to say that it's all rosy in our communities, but I ask you to look at yourselves or look outside 
Native communities before you point fingers. Because 14 million people in the United States are diagnosed with a severe alcohol abuse problem. Nationwide, 20.5 million Americans, 12 years or older, have been diagnosed with substance abuse disorder. Overdose is the leading cause of accidental death for all Americans, and between 2015 and 2016, there was a 30% increase in opiate deaths. There has been a 600% increase in the last 20 years. The number of people killed by fentanyl has risen from 3,000 to more than 20,000 in just three years. That's a 540% increase nationwide. Six people a week are currently dying in the state of Utah to opiate overdose, and these are not in American Indian communities. So with that, all that happy news, I'm going to turn it over to Davina. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yat es she Davina Spada el Shiat Kutch in Shet Kapahambashishin. Um, that is my native language of Navajo. So I'm from the Navajo Reservation. Um, I grew up um, with my grandparents. My first language was Navajo. And, and that was in Monument Valley. So having that perspective of where I came from, I, I grew up in a, a Hogan, an earth mound, no running water, no electricity. Um, and from that transition into going in the boarding school system were complete assimilation. You not, are no longer allowed to speak your language. You are no longer to practice your culture, um, your sacred ceremonies. Um, and if so, you would be beaten. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been hit by the ruler across my, my hands, the back of my head, or also on my bottom. Um, and aside from that, I was also um, I was also sexually abused, and it was not only at the boarding school but also at admission school. And if you can understand that, that's the trauma that a number of American Indians have endured since the beginning of the boarding school system. And so, because of that, we were not allowed to express what our feelings were. We, we were forbidden from that. And from that, it's been passed on from generation to generation. So my parents were also in the boarding school system. My father, same thing has, has happened with him. My mother went to the LDS placement program. There, there's also um, traumatic history in that as well, uh, which I would love to do a documentary film on that as well. But. Um, and why I, w I did documentary in the boarding school system because it's, it's everyone that I interacted when I was interviewing, it was a counseling session for them because they were afraid to speak up. They were afraid to speak up. But once they'd spoken, and I didn't, I didn't capture everything on film, but there was so much trauma that they talked about where they looked to alcohol. They talked about where they went to drugs to numb that pain because we were forbidden not to talk about our experiences. Um, thankfully, I mean, I saw my father go through, he was an alcoholic, I saw it, but not realizing why after he was able to open up by finally seeking counseling. Um, there is where I understood, you know, of his trauma and why he looked to alcohol as a, a way to numb that feeling of what he went through growing up. It was very hard to hear that. It was very hard to hear that. And so for me, um, I wanted to do a documentary film and to show society that is non-native what American Indians had to endure, what they've gone through. Um, I always hear, well, you guys have your ceremonies, you, do your, you guys do drugs, you guys have peyote. One thing about American Indians, well, I'll say for myself, for Navajo people, when their baby is born, they take that umbilical cord and they place it in a very sacred place. And that is where you are now connected to Mother Earth. 
when you're connected to Mother Earth, you do not, you do not, um, be, you're not disrespectful. Everything that Mother Earth is given to us, we use it out of respect. That would be animals, that would be trees, that would be herbs, that would be air. Everything is given to us and we should not take it. And so when we have our ceremonies, peyote is one that's well known, you know, we don't abuse that because that's something Mother Earth gave us for a purpose to use for our ceremonies. Now, of course, when, uh, when white settlers came, they brought um, alcohol. And that was a way, you know, for us to, that was something new, it was a new experience for us, you know. Um, but along with that, manifest destiny. Our assimilation, you know, taking our way, our culture, taking away our homes. Uh, we have reservations, but those are not ours. Those are not ours. If we were to get have a home there, I have to go and, and meet with, um, with our chapter officials to say, can I lease this area? You know, it's not given, to, it's still not our home. So if you can imagine, we're still homeless. Although we've been herded on these reservations, we're still homeless. And so any programs that we want to provide for our, our, our children on our reservations, we have to go to the government and apply for those funds. Um, so it's very hard to be on a reservation where you want to be self-sufficient um, because your, your identity is always taken away constantly. Um, and so when there's less, there's no employment on the reservations, where they go, they come to the cities. Well, there when you come to the cities and become an urban Indian, your identity is basically stripped from you because now you're still assimilating to a society that you're not familiar with. You know, you're not within, for Navajo people, we have our four sacred mountains. You know, for us, that's, that's very sacred. That's where we get rejuvenation. But when you leave there and come to the city, you're losing that identity. You're losing who you really are. And so you have to assimilate again where you, where you have to find employment, where you have to, um, I have four kids, and so it was very tough for me to leave the reservation, but because I knew what happened to me, and because of the, the um, because of what was, what was I was seeing on the reservation of alcoholism, drug use, um, I had to leave that, but not knowing that it could happen anywhere. It could happen anywhere. And, Sadly for my kids, they don't have that knowledge of their culture because they've been assimilated to where we currently are in the city. And so it's, it's an ongoing battle for me because I grew up, my first language was Navajo. I know how sacred that is. For Navajo people, we have this, we have a saying of Navajo people have a, they need to walk, they have to walk in beauty. And that's having balance and harmony. Well, that's really hard when you're in the city and you can't constantly speak your language. You don't know the next, I don't see anyone. Is there anyone that's American Indian here or Navajo? So it would be hard for me to talk to someone about something that's, that's important to me in my native tongue. You know, just to have that, just to see someone and say something in Navajo is so hard for me. I so want to see someone in a, to have that human touch and to have that language, it's very hard, it's, it's, it's sad, you know. This is my language now, is English. And so, um, so for my kids, they've lost that. They don't know my, the language that I grew up with. And um, same for my husband, uh, he's Northern Cheyenne. Um, he never grew up in that as, as well. So it's, it's, it's almost a dying, it's a lost language that we're, we're having to deal with in the cities. Um, Francie brought up about uh, the stereotype of natives in, in, in Hollywood film. Well, I was, before I did documentary film, I was in film. I was in movies. My first movie was Geronimo. And um, that's where I got to meet Matt Damien and uh, Jeff Bridges, uh, Robert Duvall, you know, all those great actors. But I remember my role I played, uh, my husband was getting hung and they wanted me to go get, you know, <laughs> my hair was dark, but they, they felt it wasn't dark enough, so they spray paint it black. And then they felt my skin wasn't dark enough, so they had to put fake makeup on me. 
And I, was, um, I wasn't happy with that. I wasn't happy with that. And I said, why are you making me darker? Why is my hair darker? And the costume didn't know what to say. They, I said, we're, this is who we are. We're not going to change it. So I was, I was so upset that whole day. And the director I knew very well, Walter Hill, uh, he did a, a director for another 48 hours. I got to know him very well because I also I was a lead stand-in for all the native actors there. And he said, Davina, is there something bothering you? I said, yes. Why do I have to add more makeup on me, on my skin color? Like, I'm not red. Why is it, why do I look more red? I'm not red. And my hair, you know, it's, it's not black. And throughout, if you, if you knew throughout the uh, different areas, you know, different tribes, some are light, some are dark, some are light brown, you know, we have, we're all mixed. And he said, you know, and this is how you feel, you know, we'll change it. But I said, this is how it should be all across the board, you know. And I was only 18. I, I was still learning, you know, because of the assimilation. I was so embedded with white culture, I forgot about my heritage. But then realizing this is, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. Um, and so that's why I went into to documentary film, because I wanted to set the record straight about everything that's happened for American Indians. Um, and thankfully, KUED, I've been able not only to do uh, the board, uh, uh, documentary film, which is called Unspoken, I did about um, We Shall Remain um, on the Navajo portion. I did that because I wanted people in the schools in the state of Utah um, when they look at these videos, these, these films, the documentary films, they have a better understanding, not only about Navajo people, but we have, we have Ute, the Ute tribe, we have Paiute, we have Goshute, um, and we have Shoshone. Because it's not really taught in our schools here in Utah. I, I know that for a fact because I went to school in San Juan County, and I'm gonna say that's one of the racist counties. You know, I've endured that as well, um, being in that school system. I remember going to school and doing a research project. I loved writing. I loved it so much. When I, but when I went into to see my um, English teacher, there was a research project. I knew I, what, what I wanted to do. And I did that paper so diligently. I, I did all the research. The only thing I had my mother look at was the grammar, like make sure, cross my T's, dotted my I's, whatever. I set that paper in, time for, a couple of weeks went by, teacher says, okay, I'm going to pass out the research work. I knew I was going to get an A, B. I, but the most important thing is it was about the work that I was passionate about. Well, she sets it down, big fat F, right for everyone to see, and says, I would like to see you after school, after class. I quickly flipped that over because everyone, I, could, I had a sense everyone looked and saw that big fat F. I was humiliated. And I was sat there and some of my friends said, what happened? I said, I don't know, I was ready to cry, but I said, I don't know, I'm gonna find out. Everyone left and I went up to see the teacher. And I said, I'm here to talk about this paper. She said, Davina, you did not do this. You did not do this work. I believe you plagiarized. I believe someone did it for you. And I, I did not know what to say. Like, I lost everything about my whole dignity, my whole identity, because I didn't know, I didn't at the time have a voice. So I got up and I left, and I went to see my school counselor. And I said, can you please call my mother? My mother, who was also a counselor for uh, elementary school, was called right away, and I showed it to her. But because of that, that was trauma. That was trauma. And so to this day, I still have, I have, I have self-doubt about my writing abilities. You know, sometimes I, I I'm actually, I'm, I'm applying to the MSW program, and so, you know, when you have to write, do all these writing, so I, I have, sometimes I still have that self-doubt. I mean, I'm still writing, I'm doing some screenwriting, you know, from other, for other potential documentary films, because I'd like to submit to Sundance. But because of that, it bothers me, you know. I'm not going to look to drinking. I'm not going to look to drugs because I know, again, being a Navajo person, walk, trying to walk a beauty way, I'm not going to harm myself. But if you can imagine American Indians that have to deal with that, 
they don't have that um, strength, they don't have that understanding about their culture, they will look to alcohol, they will look to um, substance abuse. Um, and it's, it is, it can be very hard, but at the same time, you know, like for schooling, I've got, I don't have free education. I have, uh, I have probably thousands and thousands of st uh, student debt loan, you know, but um, that's just, you know, those are things I'll have to deal with. But it's also about awareness. It's awareness and how, um, how to support each other, diversity, um, having that equality and equity. You know, I know for American Indians, every day, you know, is a challenge for us. So I worked in the, the Salt Lake City School District. I was an Indian education coordinator. One of the big things that I saw for my <coughs> K through 12 students is um, a lot of mental health, a lot of mental health. And I know school counselors do their best and refer to youth services, but they don't understand where our Native students are coming from. They don't have, and so for our Native students to go see someone in youth services or to see a school counselor, the first thing is trust. And that's very hard because the first thing they'll look at is the color of their skin. You know, and they get that mindset from their parents and their parents before them and before them. And so it's hard for American Indian students to open up to just someone that's not of their same culture, the same, the same background. And so they, we, we tend to just hold it in, you know, and just let it sink in and we can't open up. And um, so thankfully I worked with the Urban Indian Center in getting that pathway for our Native students. And, and remarkably, you know, some of the students, their grades have improved. So it's always about awareness. It's always about being, understanding uh, of, of where an individual comes from. Um, one thing I have, I don't know if you, for us Natives, we have about Indian time. <sighs> Believe me, I, I, growing up in the boarding school, we always had to be on time for everything. Well, Natives, for me, we wake up when the sun wakes up. You know, we wake up before then. We go, we pray to the east, to our holy people. When the sun goes down, we're going to go to bed. You know, we're not on this time restrict, you know. Um, but it's really hard because for students, that creates a prison, a pipeline. You know, for students, you know, parents, something could happen at, at, at home that the school doesn't understand or a teacher doesn't understand. And then what happens with that student? they don't feel like they're being supported because they don't understand where they're coming from the background, they're not gonna attend the school. And then from there, the teachers will say, you know what, or administrator, let's just push that kid out. Let's have them go to um, what's Horizonte, remedial school, you know, let's not work with them. We, they don't wanna work with us, we don't wanna work with them. That's, go ahead. I just wanna throw something in real quick. One of the things that when I was growing up, we had certain protocols that we adhered to at home very strictly. When somebody would come and visit my father, they would always sit like Davina and I are, side by side. You'd never sit facing each other. Uh, if my dad shook hands with somebody, it was from a distance and, and a soft handshake. But the one that troubled me and followed me through the school system more than anything else is we were told that if you respect somebody you don't invade their private space which means you don't have eye contact from the first time you speak and so if I'm speaking to somebody I respect I might be looking around I might be looking at the floor I might be doing something else it's not out of distraction, it's out of respect where I'm not trying to invade their eye space. In the school system, this is automatically interpreted as dishonesty. So when a student's trying to be traditionally respectful, they get labeled as being dishonest and sneaky. And that follows you through the system. It's, but there's a million of these little things that we're taught as respect that the school system absolutely does not understand our even attempt to reach out 
and get an understanding. When, when Davina was talking about being darkened, in the early boarding schools, when they did their before and after pictures, they reversed that. So when students came in, were sent to the boarding school, they'd take pictures of them and have them as mussed up and shaggy as they could be. When they dressed them up in their uniforms to take the after pictures, they very often had their skin bleached with chlorine bleach and then powdered with kale and clay. So not only were they now tidy, but they were also whiter. And everything in the system was to make us not equal. Never in the boarding school system was it trying to make us equal. It was trying to make us a whiter second class. Um, with the LDS placement program, um, they had a dipping system. Um, what they would do is they would round up students on the reservation and they would tell the families, oh, we're going we're gonna to take um, good care of your kids. They're going to get a great education. Uh, and not knowing that they were also going to be baptized without their consent. And so they would round up this, these, uh, round up my people, the children, and there were these big hangers. Um, I remember, recall one, one uh, woman, she's, an, she's not an elder, but um, she's, I'd say my mom's age, I better not say elder for my mom. <laughs> but um, she, remember, she recalls she was very young and her older sister, she clung on to her older sister, but she remember there was these, she said it was a big warehouse and they had the kids, unload the kids uh, from the bus in one area and they disclosed them, but she said she remembered it looked like a swimming pool, but they would have these kids go in there and they dip them because they thought maybe those kids had lice or bugs or were infested and so they were dipped in this huge um, uh, cleaning to clean those kids and then they would take them to another hangar and they would clothe them with um, our non-traditional clothing with white men's clothes and then they would clean them up and they'd take them to where all these families would be waiting for them and like we were like we were animals like oh we'll take that kid we'll take that kid they would go to social services and set them up and so not knowing whenever they would go home you know sometimes they would run away sometimes uh, they would be caught again um, and I remember a number of my my mother and all my aunts and then on my father and his sisters always felt they were there for as maids you know that's what they and not only maids they were also sexually abused as well and physically abused and so um, what I'm, I'm now going to go talk about home or on the reservation. I did a study with Utah State University on what makes marriage, Navajo marriages strong because I know uh, my parents have been together for 45 years. They've been married for 45 years. And I wanted to get a better understanding of that generation, what helped you stay together because there are a high number of um, uh, divorce rates. Well, not even divorce. I mean, um, where there's a lot of uh, single mothers on the reservation with children. And of course, the number one thing was of employment. You know, there's a low of employment on our reservation. And so the men would go off to another state be because we're well known as welders. You know, they they would be welders and they'd leave the reservation. And of course, they start another family off of there. And then here you have these kids that have grown up without no fathers, no, no, no male role models. Um, I remember in high school, um, uh, I went to Kianta High School in Arizona on the reservation. And there were times when I was afraid to go spend the night at a friend's because a couple rows, the houses down, you know, bootleggers. You know, you see, you would see in the middle of the night someone, there'll be parties, but you'll see, hear fights. And so in the early morning, I would be afraid to walk back home. Um, but just things like that. I, I remember one, e one high school event, there was a, a, guy, a, young, a young guy, I was, had a, it was a big crush. He was a football player. And my mother would never let me out, but I kind of snuck out 
and we were after the football game we were supposed to meet out and we call the boonies and I was with a group of my friends and we were behind uh, we were a ways behind and all of a sudden we see this big dust bowl and we were going up the canyon and we saw this big dust bowl close by where we were driving up on the on a cliff we get there and the guy that I had that I had a crush on with all his friends I guess they had gone up and they had been drinking but they went off the cliff and right on the road that we were driving on and we all got out and I ran up there and half of his face was not on him um, and of course there's we didn't have cell phones you know um, someone had to run and the nearest the nearest hospital was was about two hours away and so I think of course we had to call we went to the tribal police and that was a picture I will never forget you know and, and he, he did pass away of course but that was very traumatic but that's I mean that's what our fun was was getting drunk and going out into the boonies you know so those are all the traumatic things and I haven't talked about that for the longest time but that's where my advocation my advocacy comes in helping my reservation um, we have a, a Navajo, our own government system on the Navajo Nation and um, they talk about substance abuse and alcohol so I know we have a task force that's trying to put together you know these types of services so it prevents that something like this So what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to the floor if you guys have any questions. You, 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 there are problems, but you have strengths. And are, are there ways you can use those, the grandmothers, the aunties, the whatever it is to enrich and strengthen? Hmm. Um, how can we institutionalize that in some way to make it more available for everybody who would need it? Can you repeat the question <coughs> so that the... Um, the video capture. Your she wants to. Oh. Can you use your strengths? She wants to know what if we could use our strength to to support on our reservation. Are is that what you're talking about on a reservation? Um, well I think like I mentioned, um, we have our Navajo Nation government. They're seeing this, that they're seeing the problem. But again it's about uh, applying for these funds, these programs um, every year or every administration you know you always wonder if there's going to be support well right now this administration it's really an iffy you know because we know the problem we see it on our reservation um, but our Navajo Nation government is doing everything to eliminate this problem you know it's but it's, it's of course it's going to be awareness it's going to be who goes out and gets that degree to return back home um, but also when they return back home is there going to be stability for employment to continue that for these programs you know um, but I'm not going to give up on that I'm not going to give up on that hope you know I do go back home I go back to my area and I still advocate I still um, the resources like the U, you know that I see I try and build that bridge for my community because I know there is, I know there's a lot of resources, you know, but it's just finding that network, that organization that will want to go down to my reservation and, can, and, and, and build that bridge. And one of the key things, too, is also we have a lot of people that really want to go to the reservation, but they absolutely have to learn our traditional protocols and not come in and say we're here to do this and this and this they absolutely have to learn to ask the communities what is needed okay. yes, sir. are the circumstances of the first nations people in canada comparable or different and have the canadian practices and policies the made any difference or? the question is is it the same in canada with first nations there are schools in Canada that have didn't close until the 1990s that had 100 percent sexual abuse to every student that went there 
So in some ways, there it's a different system, different treaty system, different recognition. At one time, if an American Indian woman in Canada married a non-native man, her identity was destroyed. She could not claim, nor could her children claim, their rights as a native. So it's different up there. They do have, in the more rural areas, like in northern Saskatchewan and BC, they are implementing programs that have some real advantages to them. But it's a, it's a little different governmental system. But the overall um, stereotyping and abuse is, is very similar. Anyone else? So um, we, we've watched um, films about um, uh, opioid um, addiction and, and, and the films, um, the, the film was full of, of young white people. And, um, and there were many, many, many resources available to them. What is the situation? I mean, we've talked a little bit about that situation. What is the, the situation for the American Indian communities? And um, the second part of this question is also um, um, President Trump has just declared an opioid um, epidemic emergency a public, as a public health emergency, but not as a national emergency. Um, and, and therefore, funding is not so readily available. What do you see is likely to happen in terms of um, treatment for or an impact for the American mm -hmm. Indian the question is about opiate abuse and the ramifications of it, funding, et cetera. I have, I'll let Davina address Navajo, but in up north, the opiate epidemic is not as bad as meth. And we have far more meth on our reservations because frankly it's cheaper. And if you can't afford, afford the original pain pills, it's less likely you're going to get hooked on opiates. So if the healthcare there doesn't uh, prescribe them, which is part of the problem in mainstream society, that a lot of this is, begins with prescribed pain, that there's other things you turn to. So our opiate abuse up north isn't as bad as meth. Um, on my reservation, um, I think, yeah, I'd have to agree about meth, but I, right now I think one of the things, well, on our reservation, the one, it's um, against the law to sell any alcohol. And so that's why I, growing up, I remember seeing bootlegging. So um, there's a lot, it, there's a high rate of um, DUI um, because of the, because of the, the high use of alcohol that's on our reservation. Um, but meth, yes, is, is easy to come across um, and, and to make. Um, and also another is um, just like hairspray products. You know, that's an easy, or, or um, hand sanitizer. Lysol. You know, Lysol, yeah, those are all easy things that um, I know our kids are, and adults are using that's very easy to come by. Um, at home, that's a common drink, is to get a gallon of water and then spray a can of Lysol into it and then drink it. I know, I used to work at Fourth Street Clinic, and um, that was one thing that I saw a lot of our patients were um, uh, having hand sanitizer that we'd find in their bags. And uh, that, that was a, a huge, but also spice. You know, um, I'd, we'd have to do bathroom checks. And I was a supervisor of the front desk area, and we'd go into the bathroom checks, and once my, one of our cleaning lady um, was pricked by a needle that she found in the bathroom. So there's, I mean, they're really good at finding ways to hide the needles in, at the clinic, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was a side note, but um, yeah. There's a, a documentary that came out recently about white clay 
which is a non-native town. It's just off the reservation. The edge of the town is actually the border of the reservation at Pine Ridge. And they average selling 4 million cans of beer a year in a town that had 11 occupants. <laughs> and it was the people coming from Pine Ridge. And you'll see them passed out in the street. And they interviewed one man, and he, he was admitting that alcohol was the source of all of his problems, that he'd been divorced four times, that he'd had four really amazing, wonderful wives, etc. And they said, well, why do you drink? And he said, just to take the pain away for a little bit. He said, just to make it so it doesn't hurt so bad when I'm passed out. He said, I drink to pass out. And traditionally, natives do drink faster on average than other populations, but it's the numbing. It's make it go away for a while. And so until we address the issues of historic trauma, we're not going to be able to address the issues in our populations. Someone had a question over here on this side. Oh, okay. Are, are, uh, are your documentaries available so we can see them? And can you give us the names again? Yeah, yes, the documentaries are available through KUED. Um, so the first one is uh, Long Walk, Tears of the Navajo. Uh, the second is We Shall Remain. And that has the, it includes the tribes here in Utah. And the last one is Unspoken. Um, I can't remember the full title. I just go by Unspoken. Yeah, but they're all online. You can stream them online through KUED. At the beginning, you'd mentioned that uh, isolation seems to be a major contributing factor. Uh, ge geographic, economic, uh, infrastructure or, or lack thereof. Thoughts about how that might be addressed? Money. <laughs> but you got to have money to make money. In, in Montana, we have still have about a 50% high school dropout rate. And that's students that make it to high school. Our, one of our largest times of dropping out is between the 8th and ninth grade. But you're dealing with kids, they don't flunk out, they drop out. And you have kids that when it's 20 below have to walk three miles to reach a school bus because school buses can't leave the paved road. But no one can afford to pave the roads into their properties. And again, it's, it's, it's like Davina said, the tribe owns the land. We get leases on it, 100-year leases. But you can be ejected for different reasons, too. And so the, if the tribe isn't, doesn't have the ability to build the roads and everything, they're not, it's not going to happen. Because people don't have the money and aren't going to put the money in to pave a road that isn't theirs. It's complicated. <laughs> And we could probably stay here. In fact, I know that I've listened to Francie and Davina for um, days upon days and, and still not uh, know all there is to know and understand about the impacts on the American Indian communities here and, um, and indigenous communities all over the world. Um, I want to first thank Francie and Davina for coming here and sharing their thoughts with us today. And I would like to say Me'esh. Yes, thank you. And I um, want to let you know that um, this is the next to the last event in our series called Pick the Poison. Our um, event tomorrow is um, a Halloween event. We are doing um, trick or treat in the library and encourage you if you wear your costume, your Halloween costume, we'll still give you um, a, a trick or a treat and, and what we want to do is hope you'll come over to the library, visit the library, see what we have to offer, see the new things that we're doing um, here in the library. Also, this lecture was the first in this year's series, which has just two, but um, the lectures in our Native Voices uh, series. And the second one will be with Francie.